I'm just going to say a few words then um, just to, to kick it off. Um, thank you everyone for, uh, for signing up and signing in and obviously a massive thank you to all our speakers this afternoon. Um, so yeah, like I say, a bit, a bit of background for, for those of you uh, that, that don't know about me or my business or, or, or what we're doing here. Um, I'm the founder of the London Java community uh, and also run RecWorks, which is a tech recruitment company. Um, so we are all about trying to find ways that recruitment can be a force for good in the tech industry beyond just getting people jobs. Um, so what we mean by that is, is that we're not just about finding you your next job, but trying to help people find careers that they can really connect with and, and, and have a passion for, um, and then help people level up within them and, and go all in on it. So give you a taste of what we do. Uh, we organize about 15 different tech communities and groups. Um, we've run 800 uh, events now. Uh, we made our 3,000th three, 3, um, mentor introduction this week, um, and we have uh, got about 10,000 people split across the groups. Um, so it's all something that we do for free. So we get people jobs, uh, we're paid um, on, on a success basis, and then we take some of that money and drive it back into, into these community initiatives. Uh, so this year we've been doing a thing around ladder groups. So uh, groups of people that are looking to climb a similar, a similar ladder or go on a similar journey. Uh, and then bringing everyone together and trying to help take away the hurdles and, and, um, and yeah, and get everyone, everyone on, on that journey, further along that journey. Uh, so we've done the aspiring CTOs, aspiring principal engineers, and this is related to the aspiring speakers. Uh, so I think we've, we've got 55 people, I think, up on stage um, this year or, or on these events this year. Um, and this is, uh, this is an example of that. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker. Uh, Rosie, are you there? Are you ready? Hey, I'm ready. I'll just share my screen. Perfect. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, all good. Okay, great. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosie Carroll. I'm a junior software developer at Alpha Financial Software. Alpha is a fintech company and it focuses on asset finance. And this is software which backs being able to take out finance, such as leasing anything from a car to a satellite to a film. Uh, and at work, I work mostly in Java and I'm able to work on greenfield projects for clients and also refactoring our internal code base. In my spare time, I'm part of the London Java Committee Aspiring Female Speakers Group and I enjoy volunteering at Codra Future, a London-based tech charity. And I'm just going to give an introduction to modularization and some of the benefits this can have for your code base. So what is modularity? Really, this is a bit of a kind of complicated term to just sort of summarize breaking up a complicated product into smaller compartments, or in this case, we'll call them modules. And really, we've got an example here because a code base is just a complicated system and it's not so different from any other complicated system, such as a car or a body. So we have this uh, worker here and he's focusing on making the tire and someone else could be focusing on making the spoiler or the door. Uh, and they're all able to work on the product concurrently without stepping on each other's toes. And this is really important as the product begins to scale um, and you have more and more developers. Another great benefit is that it's quite hard to um, be able to comprehend everything to do with making a car or making software from back to front. And sometimes it's beneficial for people to specialize. And modularization kind of aids that specialization because when you're making a change, you only really have to think about, for the most part, things that are happening within that module. You don't have to think about everything else. And this can make a um, developer be a bit more effective. And also one of the most important things is that if we had a puncture in the tire, for example, the engine would still work, or if we had a chip in the windscreen, the battery would still work. And this is because those changes are compartmentalized, those problems are compartmentalized just within that module. Um, and especially when they're sort of peripheral or functional things like that, they aren't going to have a knock-on effect on the core systems um, of the machine. And so that's really helpful because it helped prevent bugs um, from proliferating out throughout the code base and also means when I commit something, I can be more confident because I'm aware of the, um, the limits of where the change will affect. And this helps have a sort of robust um, more product with more integrity. 
So here we have an example on the left, and this would be a kind of monolith system. So not really any um, modularity here, and um, everything can see each other, interact with each other, which is um, good in some ways, I suppose, but also very bad because then a lot of your code can be manipulated, the values changed, and interactions that you weren't anticipating or wanting. And also it can make it quite hard um, because things are very tightly coupled to be able to um, make big changes in different areas. So this is not um, ideal, but on the other hand, we could have an extremely modular system where every class, every page is in its own module. And it's not, um, and this would not be ideal because this would create a lot of problems with dependencies and it would also mean that you would maybe be able to see everything and access everything that you would need to. And so really what we'd aim for is something in the middle, um, but that would obviously depend on your company, the code base and how much time and effort you want to put into it. And so modularization really is just the art of breaking down the complicated system into smaller parts. And often these smaller parts, if possible, would be based on functional units, um, but sometimes it would be appropriate for them to be um, technical units if it's things that aren't going to change that often. And one of the sort of most important things is making sure that there's the correct visibility of the different modules so that the correct things can see each other and the incorrect things can, so that your code can't be changed and manipulated by classes that have got nothing to do with it at all. And so that's quite challenging, being able to um, decide where those boundaries of the modules lay and also um, what, so what should be able to see each other. And how this is managed is most often um, the visibility and dependencies uh, are managed through tools such as Maven, which helps you manage your dependencies. Uh, and this is another major challenge um, because you want the code to be able to obviously work and things need to be able to see each other, but also um, one of the main challenges is deciding um, what should and making sure that the interdependencies work and represent a sort of functional process. Some of the benefits of modularization are that it's more scalable because it allows multiple developers to work on um, the product concurrently, which is really important as your business scales, but also if one particular functional unit or one module um, becomes, it needs to grow, it's a lot easier to do that because it's compartmentalized and so it's easier um, to scale up that particular area without affecting the rest. It's also less complicated, so ideally it's easier to enhance because it will take um, less time to work in the area, but also it's easier to estimate the time it would take and also hopefully easier to maintain because in a less complicated code base, we might have less bugs, but also if we do, they're more um, contained and they won't proliferate out. Hopefully we would have happier developers and this is because we can have more confidence in our commits um, because we they aren't going to affect um, all these different modules hopefully and we're working in a cleaner code base which is just more pleasant. It's also more flexible uh, and this is because um, when you modularize as part of this you can use APIs and SPIs to the um, other modules which were in your code base, um, which is really useful. And this helps you create code that won't just do what it does today, but what it can do in the future. Um, and this can be a bit more sort of usable in different ways. So to summarize, uh, modularization is breaking up a complicated system into smaller sections, and a module is a distinct functional or sometimes technical unit. Uh, one of the key problems is interdependency between modules um, because they need to make sense and represent a functional journey the code is trying to do, but also you want to have as loosely coupled code as possible. And this creates a lot of benefits for staff and the overall code base. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rosie. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. It's Modularity is something that um, obviously we've, we've come across and heard about quite a bit um but it was i really like the analogy with the, with the car and the, and the way you got that across really nice way of um of explaining it all um, did anyone have any questions at all for rosie i i possibly have a question do you have any recommendations for good books or reading matter to 
know, that someone could read and uh, learn how to get better at this stuff like I need to. Um, there's lots of stuff online. I think one of the, um, so I've just read sort of different blogs, like Martin Fowler's blogs. He's like one of like the kings of modernization. He does really good stuff. So I'd recommend like looking into that. Um, but no, I've not looked at any particular books, just um, different blogs and things online. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a look at Martin Fowler's stuff again. Cheers. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Rosie. Um, I'm just going to pop a quick link to um, a feedback form. Um, so feedback is absolutely crucial um, in uh, early on in, in speaking journeys um, to to connect with people and to find out um, you know which, which bits uh, resonated with other people, which bits came through, um, and just get get some of that positive feedback of the bits that you liked. Um, so yeah, if anyone's happy to drop some feedback on there, I'd really appreciate it. Um, so next up, um, we have our own Dom Carlo um, speaking <laughs> on the aspiring women speakers. So Dom, okay. are you ready? I'm going to try and share my screen, see what happens. Okay, can you see my slides? Excellent. I can see them. Okay. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about the RecWorks Aspiring Women Speakers Group. I just want to update everyone on what we've been up to this year and give you our plans for 2021. So for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Dominique Carlo and I work at RecWorks and I'm also one of the organisers of the London Java community. So firstly, a bit of information about why we started the group. You may remember back in April, we started running these lightning talks events with the idea of it being something fun and lighthearted to do on a Friday during lockdown. We didn't actually have any speakers in the beginning. So we put out a call for help to the LJC and we had nine people come forward and they spoke at the first two events. We did realize though that no women had replied to that email to put themselves forward as a speaker. So Barry and I had a chat and we decided to set up this group the Aspiring Women Speakers Group, and the aim was to encourage and support women who wanted to get into speaking. So the group officially started in May 2020. We now have over 40 members and we've run 10 Q&A sessions with experienced women speakers. I really believe that those Q&As have inspired so many of our members to give their first talk, because since those first two sessions where we had no women speaking, we've had women at every single Lightning Talk event since. And that includes the three events where women speakers outnumbered the men. 16 women have now given a lightning talk to the LJC since May. And not only have we seen this number increase in the lightning talks events, it's also been reflected across the wider LJC. I took a look at the events we ran between January 2019 and May 2020. In that time, we only had two women speakers at the LJC. But I'm really pleased that since we started this group, 29 women have spoken to the LJC. So I think we're off to a really good start, but we know there is more work to be done. And Barry and I, we love a bit of a challenge. So we thought, should we set ourselves a target for next year? So we've decided in 2021, we would like to see 40 women speakers at the LJC. But not only that, we would like 20 of those women to be brand new speakers. Now, I've practiced this talk quite a few times out loud, and every time I say this target, it feels massive. I do believe we can achieve it. We just need a bit of help. And I think if we can all get involved as a community, we can create some real change here. I have an idea of how we can do it, and I just want to talk to you about that now. So I'm going to take you back to those Q&As I mentioned earlier with the experienced speakers because so many of those women told us a similar story about how they got into speaking. And that's because they had someone in their life, a colleague, a manager, a mentor, or someone they knew from a community like this, who encouraged them to speak, and in some cases, pushed them into doing it. So I'm just gonna share a few of those stories with you right now. So many of you know Trisha G. Trisha spoke to us about how she gave her first ever talk at the LJC because she was encouraged by people like Martin Verberg, Ben Evans and Barry. And Trish has written, written a blog post about conference speaking. And in that post, she talks about how her first conference talk at Java One came about because she was invited to co-present with a boss's boss. Obviously, Trish is now such a well-known speaker and she talks at conferences all over the world. But she says how having that Java One talk on her CV made it easier to be accepted to future conferences. And this year we met Jemima Abu at our front end community. She told us she just started attending meetups in 2019. And at one of them, a speaker asked for some help about creating a form. And so she got up on stage and she helped him. And then one of the organizers invited her to speak at the next meetup. 
And now really the rest is history. A year later, she's gone on to give 24 talks at different conferences and meetups. And Carly, one of our members, Carly has spoken to me about how Jim Goff has helped her get into speaking. And she shared how being able to speak to Jim about his experiences has made speaking seem accessible for her and not something that was reserved just for the technical elite like she might have assumed. And Jim has been there to help her talk through her worries of how could you juggle work and be a mum and be a speaker. And he listens to her ideas. He helped her with her first call for papers. And I think very importantly, he introduced her to the LJC and to this group because Carly's now spoken to us three or four times already this year. She's presented virtually at a conference and she'll be speaking to us next year at our front end community. And I'm just gonna jump in here myself because there is no way I would have given this lightning talk without support and encouragement and some pushes from Barry, Mag, Helen and Carsten. And we spoke to many, many women and they all had similar stories. There's so many I'd love to have shared with you, especially from Emily Jiang and Mae Bezeron. I wish I could share all of them. They are genuinely inspiring, but I'm running out of time. So perhaps another day. The point here though, is that I don't think you need to be a conference organizer or a Java champion to encourage and support new speakers because all of us here can do this. We know these women already because we work with them or maybe we manage them or we're mentoring them or we meet them at events like this. And I'm gonna take my own advice and encourage more new speakers in 2021. I have a colleague in mind, she probably doesn't know it yet, but I think, in fact, I know she's gonna give a great lightning talk next year. So any advice and support she needs, I'm gonna be there to make sure it happens. So if you agree with our mission, then we would love your help. Next year in 2021, we are planning 25 lightning talks events, which means we need 125 speakers. So please think about those women that you work with, manage, mentor, and that you know. And that also goes for any underrepresented group in tech anyone that you think should be speaking at one of these events, please share the details of this group or introduce them to me and Barry. I truly believe if we all work together as a community, we will see so many new speakers next year and really make a change. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in 2021. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, there is a link to the group with some feedback from our members. Uh, also Trisha's blog post on conference speaking and I picked just one Q&A out of the many, which was May's, because it was described as inspiring by two or three of our members. So please, if you're interested, give it a watch. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions, just give me a shout. Thanks very much, Dom. That was great. Um, anyone got any questions for, for Dom about the, uh, about the group? I loved it, Dom. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, One thing you. I've learned from from Trish as well, like you touched on it, is really important. Like for a person like myself who's an ally or likes to think my, of myself as an ally, is not just to mentor people, but sponsor them too and give them opportunities. Like for a while, I only thought mentoring is really important, giving advice, all this kind of good stuff. And it is, but Trish has said to me, no, sponsor, open the door, you know, because I think Martin Fowler and Martin and other folks do the same for Trish. And I was like, oh, that totally makes sense, but I like to echo that message because it is really important, I think, for anyone looking to be an ally. Yeah, the completely. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, Trisha's blog post, it does touch on that. It's really interesting, um, but I couldn't get anything about it really into the five minutes, but yes. 100%. <laughs> no, the presentation is fantastic. Trisha does it really well as well, so go and read Trisha's blog post because it is great. So thank you. Thanks, Dom. That's great. Um, yeah, it's just, and again, echoing that, there's been so many people that we speak to one after another after another who, who say that, that same thing, isn't it? Like, like somebody made me do it. Somebody made me do it. Very few people are like, yeah, I fancied getting into speaking. Um, uh, Barry made me do it, by the way, everyone. It's hi. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've got my sights on different people here as well. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much for that. So uh, now we have Max, Max Cossatz on correlating productivity and political affiliation. Max. Yeah, let's give that a try. I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen or my notes. We can screen. see. Yes. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so I'm Max Kossatz. I come from Germany, studied business IT in Wales, and now work for Red Hat in England. And I believe that we should all learn a bit more about psychology because it explains a lot, if not 
uh, even more than we, we really think we, uh, about it in other domains, including IT. Um, my, my talk is about correlating productivity and political affiliation. And uh, with productivity, I mean the effectiveness of a person's productive effort correlating effectiveness and effort. And with political affiliation, I mean the person's natural tendency towards a group of shared political positions. So not necessarily what you, what you vote. You might have voted the absolute opposite for a complex of reasons, but how you feel uh, yeah, in your heart if you hear something. So you would notice that quite often. Some people notice a bit more and some people don't, but yeah. But most, most people vote their temperament and their personality. So what's a person in the context of this presentation correlating with productivity? So I take it apart in intelligence and personality. And I want to uh, make very clear here that I think intelligence is the driving factor of most, uh, well, the most driving factor considering competence, because uh, the psych um, psychology literature is very clear on that. Uh, IQ is the best predictor for long-term success, but I think that personality is often forgotten. And I think if you do, yeah, if you get the personality part wrong, you're wasting uh, yeah, intelligence uh, quite a lot and it can get very unproductive. Um, <clears throat> so intelligence is not what I'm going to speak about. I'm going to focus on personality because I think a lot of people have spoken about intelligence and I want to focus on this. And the two categories I split those up into is stability and plasticity traits. Um, so stability traits include conscientiousness, agreeableness, emotional stability, plasticity traits include openness and extroversion. And those are the big five personality traits, uh, often also called ocean in uh, psychology. And it's the, uh, it's, it's the foundation of uh, personality psychology. Um, every other personality test you've seen so far um, probably is built on top of it. Um, it it's it's a, a really, really well um, proven um, yeah, measure of personality. Um, now, starting with the, the easiest one, agreeableness. Um, people who are agreeable are, uh, trust, um, are, are have a lot of trust, altruism, compliance, and empathy. Low in skepticism are not very demanding or criticizing. And uh, very interesting is uh, that uh, disagreeableness correlates with managerial success. I think that's quite obvious in the sense of that you have to be somewhat disagreeable to push your way through two things. Um, emotional stability. Um, people with a lot of emotional stability are good at not worrying too much, calmness, confidence, resilience, and general happiness. And the opposite is often called neuroticism and includes anxiousness, vulnerability, shifts in mood and depression. And finally, conscientiousness as a stability trait, not what most people think when they hear conscientiousness, uh, that correlates with being organized, dutiful, striving for achievement, self-disciplined, and uh, often appear in, yeah, in, in managerial categories as we will explore. Um, those people aren't careless, procrastinating, or impulsive. So now looking on the right side for plasticity traits, extroversion, I mean, everyone I think knows what I mean with extroversion. Everyone knows if they're introvert or extrovert, I hope. Um, those people are assertive, sociable, um, fun-loving, and outgoing and thrive really in, in social uh, situations. Now, openness is usually called openness to experience, which already explains it to a certain extent and often stands in opposition to conscientiousness. Um, not always, but most people tend towards one or the other. Um, those people are curious, imaginative, creative, seeking new experiences and ideas, and are usually a bit unconventional and rule-breaking. Low in openness means being more traditional, preferring routines, disliking change, and not being very imaginative or creative. So now, let's wrap that all together. I think the key thing to understand is personality types are an evolutionary survival strategy. A yeah, simple example, introverts dislike the risk of being noticed, and that's justified, depending on the situation. Um, conservatives are conscientious and low in openness. They create order and protect from chaos by often literally building borders. 
in opposition to liberals that are low in conscientiousness, somewhat low in emotional stability, but high in openness. They tear down borders to explore the unknown, risking chaos by um, valuing improvement and exploration. Uh, I sometimes feel like we're shifting towards searching for highly open people. So when we say, ah, oh, I need someone who's creative, and um, discriminating against conservatives somewhat sometimes, um, but we desperately need people who are highly structured, organized, and uh, aiming for everything that's not new, in, in short, management. And management, I don't mean like your boss, but those are good examples, but more like if, if you have a workshop and you, you deliver it a hundred times, that's conservative. It has rules of how you present it. If the content is clear, nothing new about it. But now taking an intelligent liberal and making him or her work in a routine and rules to find job is absolutely unproductive. They will look stupid, lazy and unhappy sometimes because they suffer if they can't explore the unknown and not be bound by conventions, rules and repetition. So in that case, there are the people who create the workshop maybe and do it a couple of times. And then the conservative would then love to take it on and do it a hundred or a thousand times. A good example that people always say in, in psychology is liberals create companies, conservatives manage companies because liberals want to do new things, want to create new uh, new things and conservatives like managing what exists. We need both conservatives and liberals for a healthy balance in both politics and business. So thank you very much for listening. Very interesting. Very interesting, Max. Um, does anyone have any questions to uh, to throw? I feel like I've got about a thousand. Um, does anyone anyone have any uh, any thoughts or questions on that? Uh, would you mind if you mind if I ask another question? I'm um, I'm very interested in learning more about this topic, particularly about personality types. Um, where where can I start? Where, you know, is, is there something good that I can read that's accessible, or I could learn about this stuff? I, I, I spend how, hundreds of hours listening to psychology lectures. There are a lot online. Um, if, if you search for personality type lectures, there is a lot. Um, if you want, I don't know, if you like reading, this may be, be a bit, a sound a bit out of context, uh, but Jordan Peterson, I know he's a, he's a bit <laughs> uh, controversial person because of his political perspectives. But aside, besides that, he wrote a really good book, um, 12 Rules for Life. Mm. And I think he's writing an another one now. And that touches those and gives a good introduction to those because okay. that's his actual focus. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. You know, you know, <laughs> for, what were the lectures I should search for? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, uh, alone, alone uh, personality types, you can probably spend hundreds of hours. Personality uh, types lectures. So. Cool. Thank you very yeah. much. I think what we what you're asking for there, Chris, is is Max. Can you come back and and do a do a follow up another another lecture? Um, you know, <laughs> I would sure, I love it. Ah, search for search for ocean or the big five personality model. Cool. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Max, and thanks, Chris. Um, so, Chris, as you're as you're in the swing of of speaking, then um, you're up next. Um, in fact, are you up next? Was Navina? Navina is up next, isn't she? Sorry, Navina. Um, so uh, Navina is coming up now uh, with an intro to Kafka connectors. Um, Max, if you can drop the screen on there, uh, so Navina can share. Yeah. Sorry about that. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So, right. Um, hi everyone, my name is Navina Dagoda. Um, I'm working as Senior Software Engineer in Push Technology. And today I'm going to talk about um, Apache Kafka Connect. Um, the end of today is uh, to explain what Kafka Connect is all about. Um, and I will briefly go, go through very high level concepts that you need to know to build and run the connectors. And the, I will wrap it up with the most important things that you need to consider uh, when building it yourself. Um, so, um, 
Connect API is provided in Apache Kafka library, um, so it's open source. Um, and as the name suggests, the API is used to build uh, applications to connect to any external data source with um, Kafka pipeline. And the external data source can be anything um, from any database or messaging system um, to a flat file, or it can be just a REST interface. So um, the um, connector, the the applications that you build using this API are called connectors and uh, using following the responsibilities, they are divided into two categories, uh, source uh, connectors and sync connectors. Um, and source connector is the one which you connect with the Kafka to pr produce uh, messages to publish to Kafka topics. So source connectors usually pull in messages from external system and publishes that to Kafka topics. And source connectors, uh, sorry, sync connectors um, is actually in sync, which uh, where the data from Kafka falls in and you can, and the messages are published in external system. So using the connectors, you can create uh, this kind of uh, pipeline to grab message from one system and publish it to multiple different um, uh, external systems regardless of what they are. Um, the API itself is an abstraction layer on top of um, Kafka producer and consumer APIs um, where um, this does most of the heavy lifting so you do not have to worry about managing offsets by yourself or being uh, making the components fault tolerant um, and it does not uh, require you to worry about any Kafka specific implementation details uh, because it handles that and wraps everything up into a nice um, structure. Um, when So when building the connectors, you only have to know how to interact with the external system and um, pull and push messages um, accordingly. Um, so um, the talk that Rosie gave about modularization, modular, modularization kind of fits in this aspect because it helps you create uh, very specific modular software components which are very reusable um, for different systems. So um, you can already uh, find a um, connector, for example, for a MySQL, which, uh, which is already developed by another developer or another company. And if it's open sourced um, or if it's not, and with according to license it provides, you can re reuse it for your own uh, own scenario and use case. Um, there are already some available, um, there are already many connectors available for uh, widely used external systems. Um, the Most of the connectors are open source and uh, there are some which are created by Confluent. Uh, so you can check them out in their Confluent hub. Um, they are, they are, Confluent also does the certification of connectors. So you can see if some connectors are certified or not and um, you can try it out. Um, and there are other community um, uh, open source connectors as well, which are approved by the community. But um, just be mindful that whenever you are using a connector, which is already out there, make sure that it's um, community approved and it's well tested. Um, because um, from my experience, what I have found is um, plugging in connectors are not hard, but debugging is debugging. It is because it does not provide uh, because the requirement for it to run is not uh, very easy to mock and um, to um, run it smoothly. So um, if you have uh, this in use case of you reusing a pre-built connectors that you are lucky, but if you have to build it yourself, then um, you'll need to know a couple of concepts and um, Coding itself is not very complex. Um, everything is wrapped up into interfaces. So you just have to implement some of the classes uh, and um, to, to implement them, the main things to understand is connectors are very configuration based. So um, to build it, you have to identify what configura configurations you have to set up. Um, there's a concept called connectors itself, which are used to coordinate and manage the um, tasks, which are the actual working units to um, copy data from external system to Kafka. So connectors manages tasks and tasks is the thing that actually does the work. Um, and so as I mentioned, the task, uh, the connectors, um, the uh, way you run connector is you run it within a worker process. So it's a separate process that you have to start. So if you are working in a connectors, then um, unfortunately there is no easy way to run end to end from your IDE. So you'll have to package it, build a jar and then deploy it into a uh, location where the worker will then um, come and grab and run the process. 
So um, from trying to understand connectors and building it from scratch, what I have understood is um, test testing can be a real challenge when building connectors. And because um, building dependencies to run connectors are um, are not very easy to mock or run together with IDE. So you'll have to rely a lot on your unit tests and um, 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 make sure that, and because of that, make sure that you have enough error, error handling in place because it's configuration based. The deployment is happens um, with uh, using configuration. So make sure that your configurations are properly validated and you have uh, set up enough error messages, uh, messages clear messages that um, you can use when debugging the connectors. Um, obviously, uh, make sure that there are logs available um, and they are efficient and um, also be mindful about cases when uh, errors can be re recoverable or it can be uh, recoverable or not. So think about cases where uh, the uh, task, for example, goes down and you have to restart the whole connector to uh, bring up the application. Um, it's not very uh, easy to um, grab the concept of it in five minutes talk. So I have just touched maybe less than 1% of what uh, needs to know uh, because I think uh, it can be a bit overwhelming to understand everything. And if you have, if you have to um, write a start writing Kafka applications, I think connectors provide a framework and it standardizes the whole process. So it um, brings that um, reusability perspective in place. So um, it's useful in that aspect. So if you are interested um, more in this field, then you can obviously go to the official Kafka documentation site. Um, you can check out the connectors which are already in place in Confluent Hub. Um, and obviously there are a lot of tutorials um, online that is present, so um, give it a go. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Navina. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any any questions at all for, um, for, oh yes, and Dom's just said about the feedback form. Thank you, Dom. Sorry, I'm useless. I meant to include this as well before. Um, we have had uh, feedback from Carly, Daniel, CJ, SB. So we've had it coming in. So please do keep it coming in for all the talks. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Carly, I can see you are unmuted there. Uh, I do have one. Um, so I was going to ask around the error handling thing, because this is something that I've seen in my team we struggle with a lot. Do you have any resources for best practices or maybe code samples somewhere for particular connectors that you could maybe point us to that would be helpful? Yeah, that is a... Um, um... Good question. I think um, because of the way it is, um, it's really difficult to um, ensure. So there, I have found a couple of um, good YouTube videos where it's actually there, it was a talk provided by Confront itself uh, about best practices and um, um, it's in YouTube. I can send you a link later if you want. <laughs> that would be amazing. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Navina. Really appreciate that. Um, okay, so for the final talk, uh, then we have Chris. Chris, are you are you ready? Your screen sharing, aren't you? Hey there. I'm going to try and share my screen. I'm Chris. Please bear with me whilst I share my screen. I can work out. It gives gives eight options for screens to share, and I only have two. So hopefully, I did the right one. Can you see my slides? I see nodding and thumbs up. So, all right, let's. Let's see. So thank you very much in advance for watching this little talk. Um, the clickbait title of which is one weird trick that leveled up my coding skills. That weird trick was test driven development. Don't know how many people here do test driven development, but for me, it was probably the biggest factor in me leveling up my coding skills over the past five years or so. So I'm going to spend about five minutes talking about test driven development or TDD and specifically how it helped me so much. Let me start by telling a story. So when I was a kid, I remember coming home from school and seeing this on the kitchen table. My dad had dismantled the engine of the family car and my mum was really annoyed, partly because the kitchen table was full of car bits and partly because until dad put it back together again, we weren't going anywhere in the car. So eventually dad did put the engine back together, but it took a while. And thinking about the story recently reminded me of how I used to write code. Here's my old approach to writing code. I have a feature that I need to write. What do I do? I, I dive straight in. I take the code apart. I break it. 
uh, the code is now broken. The tests don't pass. Maybe it doesn't even compile, but hey, at least I've got started. So I make some more changes and whoops, my code's even more broken. Well, I feel like I'm getting somewhere, but hey, I'd better write some tests for this, this stuff that I've just written. So I write some tests, whoops, they don't pass either. Oh dear. My code is in pieces on the kitchen table. Not only have I not finished my feature yet, my code doesn't work at all. It's no use to anyone until I put it back together, which I eventually do, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of stress. And it made me wonder, is there a better way? And eventually I found that better way, um, which is test driven development. So a lot of you may be familiar with this diagram. This is the TDD test driven development, red green refactor cycle. If I want to make a change to the behavior of the code, rather than jumping in like I used to and starting to implement it, first thing I do is I write one test that asserts some small part of the behavior that I want. And when I run the test, it doesn't pass because I haven't implemented that behavior yet. So that's red. This is the point at which I've broken my code. So what do I do? I fix the failing test as simply and as quickly as possible. Green. I implement the bare minimum amount of the feature to make the test pass. Even if it's a bit of a hack to make it pass, it's cool. I'm in a green state. My code is now not broken, but it is a bit of a hack. So what do I do? I refactor the code. I improve the design of the code without changing its behavior until it isn't a bit of a hack anymore. And I do this until I'm happy with it. And then I iterate. I write another failing test for the next bit of the feature. I go around the cycle again and again, red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor. So when I do TDD, I will go around this cycle rapidly and repeatedly, ideally once every few minutes, never straying too far from a green state where the code works, never breaking my code too much or for too long. When I've gone around the cycle enough times over hopefully maybe a few hours, I'll have implemented the feature. I will have code that I can deliver. Now, there are lots of benefits that flow from doing TDD. Your code gets good automated test coverage. It can drive you to create well-designed code. It's kind of fun. Actually, going around that cycle, that red-green refactor cycle, gives you a bit of a dopamine hit every time you go around. But for me, the most important benefit is you can never stray too far from that good state. You never break your code too much or for too long, and your code does not spend days in pieces on a kitchen table. And that is why test-driven development is the one weird trick that leveled up my coding skills. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris. Oh, <laughs> sorry, mate, I interrupted you just at the end there. You're all right. It, are there any questions? I put some resources on this slide preempting any questions about that. I'm happy to talk about these, but does anyone have any questions about that or any other aspect? Great, great talk. I, I was wondering, or I, I like the idea of TDD. The problem I have is that I sometimes need somewhat of an exploratory approach to writing my functions, let's say it like that, right? Because yeah. I'm not exactly sure how I'm approaching it. Uh, how, how would you? Uh, um, yeah, yeah so I, I could address this in two ways, really. So I'm the same, like, you know, sometimes I know exactly what I want to do in TDD, you know, I can just go in and TDD it straight away. Sometimes I'm like, kind of, yeah, well, I'm not, not really sure what to do. So one approach I often take is, number one, I don't bother TDDing it. I just hack around it, you know, I just use my old, like, generate the most hacky code in the world and just see where it takes me, you know, at least until I understand the domain better. The other approach is, um, you know, if you want to test drive something that you're writing, you don't really understand what it's going to look like. Maybe you want to write tests at a higher level of abstraction. And quite often I test drive code by writing an acceptance test at a high level where I say, okay, I'm going to send one API request into the whole system. I will then write hacky code within the whole system just to see if I can make that pass. But you know, not getting, you know, try, trying to test the what and not the how, um, which sometimes works, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I just go, meh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hack it until I understand it better. But those are my two approaches. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, to everyone for for tuning in. So there are, there is a second part to to this event. So if you only came for the lightning talks, then uh, they are now done. Uh, thanks to all of our speakers, especially the first timers. Um, it's obviously so difficult to uh, to do that that first step. So well done to to everyone there. Um, please keep the feedback coming. Really, really appreciate that. Um, so the the second part, what, what we what we tend to do at this part is invite an, an experienced speaker along um, to help to help sort of give a bit of a rounded feeling to the event um, there's obviously I, I imagine there's some of you that are watching now uh, that are thinking that looked interesting I wonder if I could do that and so we started inviting um, senior people along to kind of to, to answer some questions that we get some typical questions that come up every time uh, and help help talk through those early steps if you were interested um, so we have one of my favorite um, speakers on uh, Daniel Bryant um, Daniel was awesome and he was described, oh, I can't think who it was described in this way, but as somebody who they always want Daniel there at the front because he's uplifting and brings energy and he's always there with his with his thumbs and, and, and supporter. Um, <laughs> very, <laughs> very enthusiastic guy and gave um, one of the most inspiring presentations I heard around um, mentoring and speaking at an unconference with Abe. Um, yeah. And and yeah, so a, a guy I've, I've got a huge amount of respect for. Um, so. Dan, can you can you give just a few um, a few words about your story, um, how you got started speaking, and and kind of where you were and, and where you are now? Would you mind doing that? Yeah, sure thing, Barry. And yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. There, very nice. Uh, Barry's been super helpful to my career and my journey in general. So, hat tipped all the Retworks folks, Dom included. Like, love Retworks. Um, so, my story is very similar to Trish, actually. I so I came sort of up just behind Trish, so to speak. Trish, uh, Simon Maple, uh, Martin Verberg were. In, a few sort of years ahead of me so I learned a lot from the likes of Trish and Simon and funny enough one of my biggest door opening experiences was presenting at Java One <laughs> same kind of story as Trish right and I co-presented with Steve Poole who I'm sure many of you know like tomorrow at the unconference Steve is running that so Steve kind of opened the door for me there and exactly as as we heard from Dom earlier in the story once I had the Java One on my CV on my resume it, it, I don't know if it necessarily opened doors, but it felt like open doors and it gave me confidence because the big thing I think we all get is that imposter syndrome, right? Most folks I chat to, like I know I've mentored over the years, everyone's like, oh, I haven't got anything to speak about. I haven't got anything to talk about. And literally everyone has got something to share whether it's something just like you're interested in, something you're just learning. I just actually had a new uh, member of my team join and, and I was um, coaching him a little bit on speaking. And I was like, and he's like, oh, I, I hate being junior. And I was like, take this as a magic moment because junior, if you're junior in something, we're all junior in something, right? It's very easy to empathize with other folks in the same situation. When you become an expert, it's really hard to teach and share your knowledge. If folks have bumped into the Dreyfus model of learning, where you know, like trying to get like experts to explain what they do is really hard. Uh, I studied actually a bit in, in oncology and chatting some of the cancer cancer specialists was amazing, but getting them to break down how they made decisions was was impossible to codify in a computer. So I learned that one very early on in my career. I digress anyway, but I definitely think. Um, the, the mentoring, the sponsoring, again, all the names you've heard already, Martin, um, Ben, Ben opened doors in particular to me. So Ben opened doors to, Ben Evans, this is opened doors to InfoQ. That was definitely an inflection point in my career, writing for InfoQ. I still, I lead the team at InfoQ, writing team now. So pick me up if you want to get involved in InfoQ. And Ben also introduced me to O'Reilly, where I wrote my first book with Abraham, who you mentioned Barry as well. So for me, like the LJC was a pivotal moment in my career and that opened up other pivotal moments in my career and as I've gone through those sort of different parts of my career I've just done more speaking stuff and and as you get more visibility more opportunities present themselves I'm always looking to help people I learned that from Ben and Martin at a very early stage um, when you're chatting to someone at a conference ask how can I help you and quite often you know the, the opportunity pops up at a serendipity like oh they're looking you know, they're looking for someone to speak about x topic at this event Ta -da! Even if it's not the case, like Martin, I'm, uh, I helped him run a workshop, an LJC workshop. And then we got chatting over sandwiches at lunch. And he was like, hey, you know, there's this uh, open JDK thing we need to talk about at Java One. I was like, sign me up. San Francisco in October, I consider myself there, right? And I love speaking. And then the career just kind of 
you know, now I do that. Like, I'm very lucky now I am, I'm director of DevRel at Ambassador Labs. So I literally get to speak a lot and like my team, I encourage my team to do the same thing. So it's, uh, it's been a fantastic ride the last like 20 or so years. Great, thanks, Daniel. Um, Daniel's helped me understand a, a few different bits. So one of the things um, I still remember you saying that we, so we, at the very beginning, uh, like when Dom was talking about, I think it was back in April, um, we ran a panel event um, on this kind of how to get started. And we had Daniel, we had Martin, we had Trish, we had a bunch of different people speaking. And I remember you saying there about this, um, when you're in a junior, uh, when you've just learned something, uh, according to the Dreyfus model as well, you, you've just, you just understand all the mental models to get past that initial uh, challenges. You know, you have, you've just had the Eureka. Um, I think it's so important. That so, so many people feel so junior, feel like they've got nothing to add, but if you've just learned anything, like uh, I think that is, that's huge. That's, that's one thing I remember from, from that event that, that really changed how, how I think about things. Um, okay. So uh, another thing you've talked about, in fact, two more things that I wanted to get you to, to share. Um, I remember when I asked you before and you guys, you and Abe were talking about um, how you loved speaking, how it impacted your career. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but how, but how, but how? Um, I was that irritating one that kept asking you questions. And, and you, you both said it, it, one of the biggest things for both of you was that it helped you connect with people that were like you, like these incredible, interesting people that, that shared your, um, your passions and things. Can you talk around that at all? Some of the people, some of the other people that you've connected with and, and you know, how, that's, how that's changed things for you? Yeah, Barry, it's an interesting question. And it, I think it often comes back to um, like sort of being good at something or being reasonable, reasonably skilled at something and being known for it. They're often two different things, right? I, I meet and work with some amazing programmers that either you know, don't want to be on the conference circuit or didn't know it was an opportunity, right? You didn't, didn't um, sort of think it was a thing. So for me, just going around talking about what I was doing, connecting me with interesting people that, oh, you know, he likes... He's interested in Docker. I'm interested in Docker. Let's have a chat over a coffee after the session, which is just fantastic at talks, right? But it also gave people permission to do the same thing, right? So I'd be, I'd be speaking and then they go, you know, I'm like, I am really thought about speaking. How do you get into it? And I'd explain like, I, I really like understanding things. Like that's definitely one of my sort of life things. I really like understanding things. And I was an academic for a while. I, I, was, I did a PhD and taught at university for a bit. And the cool thing there was, you have to really understand something well to teach it. I learned that very early on. Um, and, you know, so if you're really interested in something and then you want to teach it or present about it, it's a great way to really explore the depths and the questions you get asked. That, and then you suddenly realize that, oh, I don't know that. That's a gap in my knowledge. So it's just this virtuous circle of connecting with interesting people, asking interesting questions and then you form the little mini communities like we had a little open jdk community in the ljc for a while and we still do uh, and these things like talking about your passions in, in a public forum like here is a great way to put the put the word out there that you care about this and maybe others do too cool. um okay another thing you, you you've spoken about quite a bit in the past is writing um, and again, another virtuous circle that I've heard you talk about in the past is how your speaking improved your writing, your writing improved yeah, your, your understanding of the subject and it all, all fit together. Um, this is an aspiring speakers group, but obviously writing is, is the other side of the coin on that. Can you, can you speak around that at all, um, around how, how you got into writing and, and maybe your journey with InfoQ and, and, and that kind of thing, how it's then impacted your speaking? Yeah, right. So I, I think it comes back to like, I can't remember who famous sort of uh, poet, or, poet or writer said like um when thinking about tools is it a good tool to think with yeah so I, I apply that to a lot of things in life is you know if i'm learning a new language is it a good tool to think with and whether it's learning to code learning to present learning to write there's a lot of similarity in these things uh, we heard it in the first talk right modularization uh, encapsulation loose coupling high cohesion is coding is presentations is writing do you know I mean, I learned this very early on in InvoQ, you know, um, every sentence, you know, has to be sort of a certain structure, every paragraph has to be a certain structure. And then when you look, it's, it's all, it's turtles all the way down a lot of times, right? And that's the same with systems, the same with writing. And, and I found it hard to learn sort of all the rules in one medium. So I went all in and learned about architecture. But then when I started presenting, I realized I had to actually make things simpler, for example. I, when I, my academic style was very much dump it all on the slide and let everyone read. And I learned very early on that's not appropriate. Like one line, 
that is the way that is a role and, and talk to it. So that kind of this simplification I learned from present presenting. I think from writing to do with the InfoQ style, it's a, it's a news website, so it's very information dense. So I learned to write very concise, fact packed sentences, very different than my academic style I was taught. Uh, and that got me thinking around um, coding as well, like being, you know, uh, having good method names, right? And, and the method being des descriptive of what the actual thing does and then composing them up you know, into other high level concepts. So I, I don't know, for me, it was just, I think I learned best across multiple mediums, right? Whether, you know, I learned a bit about architecture, then a bit about presentations, a bit about writing. And when I take a step back, I see there's a connection between all these things, right? So I've learned to, um, to yeah, to just con like, constantly learn, basically. It's surprising. Um, some random thing like I love running I love exercise and stuff and I'll learn something about like physiology right from like running and that'll apply to my coding and apply to my writing and I'm like whoa like that's a bit meta <laughs> do you know what I mean so constant learning is the way I think to continually it sounds a cliche but to continually improve yeah I couldn't agree more I've, I've, we've been involved in in various different things so we've done the Q&A's within um, the speakers and the aspiring women speakers groups and um, we've also got aspiring principals, aspiring CTOs, and uh, we've also got a group for interim and fractional CTOs. So I've been speaking to all these different people, experts and mentors across all these different areas. And you, you're absolutely right, all kind of coming together around this communication and these different mediums, but the same message, like the better you are at communicating yes. in various different formats, um, it just makes everything um, that, that much easier. Um, Dom, it's scaring me that there's someone behind you. I can just see someone with what looks like a weapon in their hand behind you in, in your thing. My, my window cleaner, because I can't have a Zoom call without somebody ringing the doorbell, obviously. Amazing. <laughs> right, be careful. Be careful. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions for Daniel? I feel like I could talk to him all day, but um, does anyone have anything that they'd like to ask? Um, so I, I, I have a question. I'm trying to work out how to, how to phrase this best. So I... Um, earlier in my career, you know, when I was quite young, I had some experience, or you know, basically, I got up on stage to, at a conference with one of my more senior colleagues, and we did a conference talk. And um, without putting too fine a point on it, I think I did, you know, I, I kind of sucked. So, you know, my colleague was, you know, colleague did a great job, and I tripped over all my words and said every other word was um, and it really knocked my confidence at that time. And that's probably why it's, you know, it's taken me a number of years before I got back to the point where, you know, I want to get back on that horse. Do you have any advice for someone who goes through that sort of experience, you know, where they learn what things they suck at and, um, mm. you know, and have a bad experience like that? It's interesting you mentioned that, Chris, because I've definitely been there right straight up. Like, I can empathize with that situation. I don't know if anyone saw on Twitter, I literally retweeted, I think Barry and Dom put some kind words about me being an experienced speaker. And I said, in this context, experience means I've made more mistakes than you. That's the only thing, right? <laughs> I've got up on stage, I've bombed, I've forgotten my words, I've broken my laptop, I've done it all right. And 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 I think the, the best advice I say is, you know, is, the, is to get back on the horse, whatever stage where you feel comfortable at, definitely do it again. Um, and uh, if, it, if it works for you reflecting, like sometimes I, like what I used to do very on in my career is watch my talks back. And that was weird, right? Hearing my voice, watching my, I've got, I move my hands a lot. You can still see I do it, I've got better, but I still do it. Like there's certain things I don't like that I do, but it was really interesting to watch myself back and go, oh, perhaps I can change this and, you know. Um, and so I, I definitely say plug away at it. And also what I found is, again, learning new things has helped me build different skills. So I talk very fast, I still do, and I do mangle my words sometimes. And recording podcasts has really helped me with that because I've learned, like, I, I was listening back to myself and I was like, oh, I, I, no wonder people don't understand what I'm saying. When my brain is going super fast, my words get jumbled. So now I try and recognize when that happens and stop. But I only from podcasting, listening to myself way too much when I was editing the audio, did I cotton on? Yeah. So I, I think like getting that feedback and if, it's, if you don't want to do it yourself, asking a trusted friend or mentor, that's really helpful. Yeah. You know, even I've got a bunch of mentors that, you know, some of them are brutal with, with the feedback and some of them are super soft. So if I'm feeling a bit delicate, I will go to the ones that I know are a bit easy and then I'll level up as, as I get you know, more confident. Right. So building a, a network like Barry and the team are doing here is, is really good. Do you know what I mean? Say like a, a safe space, try some stuff. Does it work? No, iterate, get that feedback. Like feedback for everything we do in life is, is really critical, that communication. So I appreciate a lot of words there, but that's my, my advice to you. It's great to see you here. Like that, that's number one, right? You come back and you, you're trying it again. 
just iterate my advice. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, Sam, uh, I know you're on the call here. Um, could you just, uh, because basically I, I was in a, a presentation that Sam gave. Sam is an aspiring speaker, has given four or five presentations to LJC now, and she spoke about this um, directly this week. Um, so Sam, could you share a bit of that, a bit of your thoughts on that as well? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Daniel, for your talk. It was great in terms of getting that insight. Um, so for the past, I suppose, 30 days in November, I recorded myself in terms of, I suppose, get the understanding of how I viewed myself and um, understand how I spoke. Because I, for me, I speak quite fast. And I think for me, it's always been a negative feedback. And for me, recording myself, as you said, like in terms of podcasts, it's been great in terms of understanding a bit more about yourself, understand how you talk. But for me, there was one thing I realised I did do in the first week, and that was negative um, feedback for myself. I was really so critical in mm. terms of being like, oh, no, I don't sound great. Oh, this went wrong. So how did you deal with, I suppose, negative self-talk? Oh, that, that's a really good question, because that and this is going sort of super deep in that. And I, I, it's something so I've read quite a bit about psychology, pop psychology, Max, all the stuff you, you were talking about as well. And uh, like I. It's something I try. So I, I, for me personally, I found meditation really good. I got super lucky when I was at university. I, I really got into Buddhism and, and uh, Eastern philosophy. So I studied like Tai Chi and, and, and meditation and so forth. And for me, meditation is, a, is, a, is like a foundational practice to that. My mind, I think is a gift, right? My mind is super busy going 10 to the dozen, working out problems. But that when I get stuck on a, someone says something bad, it's like a spiral do you know what I mean so for me that that meditation thing is like a foundation to allow me to step away and go oh calm down Daniel <laughs> like, it's fine you got 10 bits of good feedback there and one negative one let's focus on the good stuff right um so for me like foundational practices of just knowing myself a bit better and, and meditation calms my mind um and then really I, I do think again the trusted friends thing is really important here because um I, I'm an introvert. I like actually my own company, but it's so beneficial when I chat to other folks and they go, oh yeah, sure. You do speak a bit fast, but you're really good at structure. I really like this. I really like that. I'm like, cool. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think that like, even as an introvert, I recommend that. Like I recharge on my own typically, but getting the feedback and the kind of, it's the human culture thing. And then we need those, we need that connection. I think I'd recommend folks like, like these communities is fantastic. Just sharing things, um, safe space, feedback and then you know and, and then and be honest as well if you say hey that like that feedback was great but it kind of it's not what I needed at the moment that was that was hurtful <laughs> like even to yourself or to some other people like that's totally fine to do that as well right and just you know and, and it's sort of a uh, uh, thing to yourself and to other people try and uh, describe what you're after in terms of feedback because um, I've definitely seen that where people don't describe what they're after and then someone like we're all built differently right so someone will just go oh you spoke really fast and I was like no 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 I'd like feedback on my overall structure of my talk, please. And then, you know, that helped me focus on the, the, the less negative things. Yeah, 100%. Um, and just, I don't know if I introduced Sam properly on that, but Sam spoke earlier this week about how she had spoken to herself, recorded herself for 30 minutes a day for 30 days um, and, and then showed these videos of the improvements. It was amazing. Like, Dom, is it up already on, is it recorded? Is it up? um i edited it today so we'll be seeing it depends how long youtube takes to process the edit but okay. should, monday or tuesday at the latest yeah so well 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 worth a watch it's, it's, it was based on a blog post you read i believe so it was yeah a medium blog post yeah yeah um but yeah uh, you could just the the results were so clear um and you can see why but obviously the first week was excruciating as, as she said <laughs> Um, I can well imagine that. Um, okay, guys, we've run over half past now. So um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming, for staying. Anyone that's still there out in the audience that wants to get involved, please, please, please do get involved. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you next time and hopefully see some of you tomorrow at the Unconference. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll be there. Thank you so much. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye.